And we believe, according to your word, that you shall do this and that you have a tremendous plan of restoration and salvation. You people know. And we just pray that you will continue to unfold this to uh, your called out and chosen. And that you will continue to pr uh, prepare us for this great ministry, uh, this great plan of restoration that you have uh, instituted and that you will provide for those who can see it in your word and those who understand the great calling and commission that you have for us, that they will call out to you and they will want to be a part of this ministry of restoration. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Okay, you may be seated. Um, I uh, want to begin this morning by uh, saying that it's good to be back. Uh, we had to leave, of course, last week and go visit my uh, son, Sean, and his new bride in Seattle. And we had a very good vi visit with them over the weekend. And uh, she uh, is Baptist, I've told you all. And uh, they go to this uh, Baptist church in Seattle. And they were having a, uh, what they would refer to as an Easter uh play and uh, so we uh, went and it was a it was a pretty decent play on uh, you know Christ and the resurrection is you know had the basics in there and you know so uh, I was uh, pleasantly pleased by what I saw and we, and, uh, we um, uh, enjoyed the fellowship there they did invite everybody to go downstairs for coffee and cookies afterwards and they said and the minister says and please visit the bookstore so my ears kind of perked up at that point and said oh a bookstore I'm gonna go visit the bookstore and uh, I was in there and I uh, found a few books and uh, I had my my uh, back uh, away from the door and uh, of course I'm looking at the books and concentrating on the different titles that are there and see what all I might be interested in and somebody tapped me on the shoulder and I turn around and it was uh, the minister of the church and he knows Sean and Deanna uh, quite well and he didn't really know who I was and uh, I uh, he introduced himself to me, and I introduced myself as uh, as uh, Dave Barley, and he said, oh, you're Sean's dad. And uh, I said, yes, I am. <clears throat> and what's that? He put two and two together. <laughs> yeah, he put two and two together. Uh, I'm not sure what all Sean has told him about me or what I believe or anything, but uh, uh he says, you know, that book you have in your hand is a really good book. And he says, uh, in fact, uh, that uh, doctor, um, the uh, doctor who uh, wrote that, his name is Ruckman. And he has a huge series of commentary. And he pointed me at, at another side of the room at this uh, this whole bookshelf was taken up by his commentaries that he had written over the years. He's in his 90s now. I said, well, that's very interesting. I said, uh, the man is obviously quite the, sc the scholar. And he says, yes, but he's, he's kind of a racist. And I said, Boy, you I said well, <laughs> what do you mean by that he's kind of a racist? He says, well... You know, he's from the South, and, you know, he, uh, uh, he kind of uh, says some things that uh, we wouldn't find too favorable concerning some of the other races from time to time in some of his remarks. And, <clears throat> on, and uh, he, says, uh, he says, as a matter of fact, he says, uh, I don't tell anybody this, but he says, I'll show you in the scriptures what I'm talking about here. And so he grabbed, he had a copy of this Bible here. 
and this is written by, well, it's, uh, it's a commentary in here by Dr. Ruckman. All right, so he turns to, he turns to Psalms 28, which I'm going to do right now in this Bible. Don't, you don't need to. No, I, I like it. I mean, you can go ahead and do it. That's fine. But uh, uh, Psalms 28, and verse 1 says, The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as lions. And it goes on talking about the transgressions of the land, etc. And then 4, about those that forsake the law, praise the wicked. And then he, right here at the bottom of the page, he says, well, let me read to you what Dr. Ruckman said, which I'm going to do for you now. Quote, most Christians, and, and he's, he's given a commentary on what I just read to you. Most Christians in America are chicken-livered yellow. And he puts it here, note Proverbs 24.10. As the days of Lot come upon us, Luke 17, 28. The sodomites now have some control over police forces, legislation, senators, mayors, and governors. If the righteous aren't as bold as they are, faggots and butches will eventually take over the government they did in Greece. He goes on and, and talks uh, more about that, about what's happening in America today. I said, <clears throat> excuse me, I said, and this is written, this is a Bible available? He says, yeah, it just came out not too long ago. He finished it, uh, you know, he's in his 90s, and his name is Dr. Ruckman. I said, do you happen to have any of those Bibles available? Because I'm looking for a Bible at, at this very time. He said, well, yeah, it's right over here. And he went to the bottom of the stack and pulled one up. I said, I'd like, I'd like that copy, please. And he kind of reluctantly gave it to me, you know. So uh, I just wanted to, and it's King James, which is what I wanted. I wanted a King James version of the Bible. And uh, so I just, I am kind of honored to have this Bible right now because it's not that I'm going to agree with his, all of his commentary or thoughts on different things, but for this man to be bold enough to say that, he goes on to tell me, he says, you know, Dr. Ruckman says things I can't even say in my own church. And I said, no, you can't. And he kind of looked at me kind of weird. I says, well, for one thing, you're a 501c3 church. Next, and I said, secondly, uh, if you did, they, if you so, told your congregation these things, by what I can tell of your congregation that I saw, they would kick you out. And he just kind of looked at me kind of funny. He says, I think you're right. <laughs> so... Uh, he saw, he and I had an interesting meeting of the minds, and he saw that I was kind of like a Dr. Ruckman. I could tell by the way he, he started talking to me after a bit. He's like, man, you're, you're different. You're not afraid to tell it like it is. And we, I didn't say it in a rude way. Okay, of course, I guess that's a matter of interpretation. Some people might interpret that as being rude. But nonetheless, I wasn't, I wasn't meaning to be rude or anything. Yeah, but we don't know what all he's written and what else he was referring to because he didn't go over all the different examples. Right. Yeah. 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 So, so um, I have to move ahead here rapidly because we have a lot to cover. But I just wanted to share that with you. Yes, I am. Yes. Yes. I'm sorry that you have to stare at the TV for just a little bit longer. Uh, uh, let me uh, look down here and make sure. Okay, I want to read this real quick. My wife, uh, a gentleman from Oregon sent this to us, and it's pretty good. It's very hard-hitting. I hope you can handle it. It's called Legal Perception. How many of you are aware of the... Uh, uh, situation with the abortion doctor that was shot in a church not too long ago and there was a trial and he was, this guy was convicted. Here's what this says on legal perception. Quote, we reported to you sometime back about the abortion doctor who was killed in his church one, one Sunday morning. Think about that. 
an abortion doctor killed in a, quote, Christian church on a Sunday morning. Goes on to say, quote, This doctor had killed many thousands of children in his bloody career, many of them late-term abortions. We felt it was very appropriate for this baby killer to be executed at the house of God, for it was God's law that he had so grievously violated for all those years, and it is God's law which demands that retribution be made. Now, a lot of people, I'm going to stop right there for a moment, a lot of people will hear that and be outraged and appalled that how could this person uh, dare uphold this, this murder of this murderer in the house of God? And I do want to tell you something, folks, if you will stop and think about it, it is appropriate, I believe. Now, I'm going to go on, and I just want to place that in your uh, thought process. We'll continue. Scott Roeder willingly confessed to the execution, and he did. He didn't back down. He willingly confessed to it and said that he did what he did because he wanted to prevent the murder of more children. His defense was that others were in imminent danger and that he did what he felt was necessary to protect them. While many preachers across the nation would call what uh, Mr. Roeder did murder, we feel justice was served, and we feel compelled to call for the Medal of Honor to be given to Mr. Roeder. Wow. I am reminded of the story, he says, of Sergeant Calvin Coleman, uh, Coleman, York. Here was a man who reportedly did not believe in guns or killing because of his Christian faith. He took the commandment, Thou shalt not kill seriously. And yet, he was called to serve his country in World, World War I. Reportedly wrestled with the matter, but one day he was faith, faced with a combat situation in which his buddies were dropping like flies, and he knew that the only way he could save his buddies was to take out the enemy. Something stirred, something stirred up within him, and he single-handedly took out 32 German machine guns, killed 28 Germans, and taking 132 others as prisoners. Sergeant York, and some of you remember the movie that was done about him, was given the Medal of Honor for his act of bravery and heroism. But Scott Roeder was sentenced to life in prison cell for his actions. It is a crying shame when the lives of innocent are considered worthless and the life of a baby killer is considered precious. End of quote from this particular article. Well, I know that's, that's uh, hard for a lot of people to take. And, uh, you know, it's hard for me to take that Christians can just sit by and just let this continue and continue. And he's in a church, he's in a supposed Christian church, and that minister ought to be up there pointing his finger at him at the very least and telling him, God Almighty condemns this and God Almighty condemns what you're doing. I mean, I, uh, I don't think I would sit back. I'm not going to tell you what all I do, but I don't think I'd just sit back and take that lightly. And so, uh, I salute that man, and I pray for him. We all ought to pray for him. Yes. Okay, with that, boy, I'm just hitting you with one... Uh, Strong thing right after another here. Well, what did you come to church for? Here's something light and fluffy. All right, uh, now we're going to play. If you have this uh, thing to go ahead, this is, I just have to play this. I love Pastor Manning before. We, uh, this is a man, he's a, he's a black man. I love to shake his hand. of them don't marry the mother. I think you're going to like. So you can't say anything about him because he's partially alleged to the African-American people. 
And you know, black people were, uh, always walk around with a chip on their shoulder because they're black, daring anybody to say anything to them. And our society has been hijacked and kidnapped and pushed into a corner where no one can say anything publicly about black people. If you do, they call you a racist and a bigot. So the true thoughts and true dialogue between white folk and black folk cannot go forward because you cannot speak your mind or the truth without be, being called a racist if you say anything about the spirits of black folk, the habits of black folk, the spirit that black folk are full of, black men are full of abandonment, they are full of murder, they are full of robbery, and they are full of violence. Now that is not to say that all black men are, but 70% of them are. 70% of them desert their children. 70% of them don't marry the mothers that they father children through. 1.2 million, 1 million of them are in prison. And this has nothing to do with white folk or slavery. So you can't, most, we can't have a true and meaningful dialogue about race in this nation because if you say anything against black folk, you will be drummed out of town and out of church. So here's what I want to say to you as we go forward to fight this battle. The first thing we're going to have to do, you're going to have to do what I'm doing. You've got to stand up and not be worried about popular opinion or what people say about you or what people think about you. Black people got a chip on their shoulder. If you want to knock it off, knock it off. Knock that chip right off their shoulders. I mean, they knock chips off of everybody else's shoulder. I mean, what is fair is fair. We've got to get rid of what I have referred to as affirmative black uh, social affirmative action, the way we have to walk around eggshells, the way white people have to walk on eggshells around black people, on the job, in the church, and every place else. If you're white, you have to walk on white eggshells so that you don't offend these black people that wear uh, their racism on their shoulder, their, their blackness on the shoulder, and they wear, they, wear, they wear slavery on their sleeves. This has got to stop. It is hurting the black race, it is destroying the white race, and it's pulverizing our nation in terms of this relation, and we're working together united to be able to make for a greater nation and even a greater church to give God the glory. I say unto you, stop white people, stop walking on eggshells around black people. I mean, who are they anyway that you got to be so careful about everything? Everything you say, everything you do, every place you go, and every turnaround, you got to hear slavery. Every other moment, you got to hear something about slavery, or you got to hear something about police brutality. I mean, it just needs to stop. And black folk are not going to stop lapping this up and pushing you into a corner and bribing you and making you act like a misfit while you're around them and having you so glad that you're no longer in their presence when you finally leave work or wherever else you are with them, you can finally relax and be yourself. This has got to stop because it's destroying black people. It is giving them a false sense of security, making them think that they don't have to do anything to better their lives, that you are the cause of everything that's going wrong with them. Now, if you white folk are tired, if you are tired, if you're sick and tired of hearing black folk blame you for everything that's wrong with them, stop acting like you are wrong. You are the blame. You are the reason for everything that's wrong with black folk. You're not. So stop acting like it. Knock them chips off those black folks' shoulders and knock that slavery off of their sleeves. And can an amen and a boom shakalaka go right there? Praise Almighty God. I'm Pastor James David Manning, and we're going to put an end to this mess going on here in America, and we're going to build a great nation of unity. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I just, think, I just find uh, this Pastor Manning very refreshing. You know, it kind of gives me hope, too, because this is a black man, and he's not the only one. There are thousands and thousands of them. Most of them don't have the outlet that Pastor Manning does. Uh, it's amazing to me that, and obviously he's getting black support for what he's doing. It's amazing to me that uh, 
there's the support available for him and that he's able to get on television, he's able to get on YouTube, he's able to uh, uh, produce these videos and do these, these talks and do these investigations. He's doing an investigation right now on, on uh, President Obama. And I uh, hesitate calling him president because I really don't believe he is a legitimate president of the United States. I don't, it's like Pastor Manny refers to him as an alien. He doesn't have, a, I don't believe, a legitimate birth certificate. And I'm under no obligation to accept what they're telling me that he does have a legitimate birth certificate until he produces one. I don't want to see a manufactured one from the state of Hawaii. I want to see the original legitimate legal birth certificate, and then we'll take a, uh, talk about it from there. Now, um, even if they, you know, they're not going to come out with it because it's politically unacceptable. It's not just incorrect, it's unacceptable. We would have black riots throughout this nation. Do you know what? Let it come. I mean, are we going to step back as we have been and uh, give lip service to the spirit of iniquity in whatever shape or form it comes in. I mean, are we going to be truth advocates or are we going to be supporters of the, all the lies? And it's the truth will set us free, not the lies. We've got it backwards, folks. It's the truth, which is found in Jesus Christ. It is a liberating truth of Jesus Christ. He is the Word. We've got to get back, therefore, to the Word of God, apply the Word of God, use the Word of God. Don't back down from the Word of God. That's a problem with Christianity today. Christianity is not Christianity if you're not going to use the Word of God in its fullness. Now, there's reality and there's non-reality. I maintain that biblical reality is where we ought to live and dwell and have our being. And that's a little bit of a different concept for, for people to think about. My wife was sharing this with me the other day about biblical values and reality and, and versus fantasy. And that God's biblical way of life, His biblical divine way, uh, which includes, again, biblical principles, it requires faith. Are you with me? It requires faith. Now I want to add to this. Work. Uh, God Almighty has told us in His Word that faith without works are dead. What is this, or should this tell us, Christians? It should tell us that if we apply God's Word, it will work. But now, I want you to step back just a little bit a little bit, and think about this. What this means is that uh, we have to apply it, we have to believe it, and we have to add to this work faith. As James said, faith without works are dead. In other words, this tells, it should tell us that if we do God's will, it's not going to necessarily work at first. What? Why, that doesn't sound of faith. No, listen to what I'm telling you. I've noticed this in my life. I'm sure you've noticed it in your life as well, that it, is, it takes time. It takes faith. It's not just go forward and do something we want the simple way out in life. God's way is, I want you to do what I said because I told you to do it. Whether well, you understand it or not, I want you to obey my word. That's what God Almighty says. And when you do it, well, it just doesn't feel right. How many of you have done God's word, and I know you have, and it just doesn't feel right because you're so used to doing it the worldly way in a sense or the carnally accepted way. But God's way is, do what I say, apply it, and, and as you're going forth doing God's Word, one thing you're going to notice real quick is that you have to apply faith to it. You have to walk in faith. 
It requires faith. Now, if we take that perspective and we add it to our daily life, then I think we're, we're not going to be so hesitant to flee or to run away from our biblical duties and responsibilities, yet we will move forward in boldness and faith and say, you know, this is what God's Word says. I'm going to stand on it. I'm going to do it, and I'm going to apply it by faith. And you will notice, yeah, it's going to take some time, but as you do it in faith, it'll get easier and easier and easier, and you will get results. But that's a whole new paradigm shift from the way that we've been thinking, is it not, folks? Now, I believe this has to do with the new covenant. And you, when you look at the new covenant, we went over some verses last time and the time for that, how the new covenant, I mean, it's just throughout the Bible in so many places that we had missed before. And, it, and it, maybe it's worded a little bit differently, but it's bang, bang, bang. Line up on line, here a little and there a little. Throughout the Word of God, it's the new covenant, and it is God's plan because Jesus Christ is the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the creator of all things. I'm going to keep repeating that until we really get it in our heads. Because God Almighty, because that is our heart. Biblically, you look up heart, it's our head, it's our mind. It's our minds which have to be renewed. We, um, we need to go back, and we need to look at, uh, we need to go and look at Luke. And uh, Luke chapter 6, concerning our foundation, verse 46. Luke ch chapter 6, and verse 46. Jesus again says, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built an house and digged deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the steam beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. For he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built an house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Here's the plan right here of salvation for America. Does that make sense? You all hear what I'm saying? Yep. I mean, to me, that is just, that is a profound concept that is so full of vital truth for Christians. Here's the plan. We need to restore America. We need to take back America. We need a, we don't need a tea party. We need to apply what God's Word says right here and believe it. And what do we got to do? We got to believe God's Word and we've got to do it. We've got to build our house upon the rock, which is Jesus Christ and His Word. And any other foundation is sinking sand. You know, today in this world, they're so fond of having committees and political action groups and this and that, right? And to oversee every little thing. And we got to, and we got to have a congressional investigation of this and that. Well, okay, if that's, if that's what you want... Let's have biblical Christian disciples who know what this verse says, who know what the foundation is to be, and let's have them go around inspecting all the different foundations in America and let them give their seal of approval that this is built upon the rock of Jesus Christ and His Word before anything is built out there. How's that? You want to set up a group, a committee, a bureaucracy? Well, let's take a look at it. Let's see what it's based upon. Is it based upon socialism, Darwinism, evolution, or is it based upon the Word of God? Is it based upon the humanistic principles and concepts of man that come out of the intellectual brilliance of man? Or is it, or is it come from a humble, born-again, Holy Spirit-guided and led experience that 
wants to serve Jesus Christ, that understands that Jesus Christ is the author and the finisher of our faith because He is the creator of all things and by Him all things consist and have their being. Isn't that profound? What a whole new concept we're talking about here when we're talking about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. So Israel is under covenant. Now, when we're talking about Israel being under covenant, that should bring a lot of things to mind. But most importantly, it's Israel, are you established upon what we're reading here in Luke, first of all? Is your foundation right? I contend that until Israel's foundation is right, because that's God's order, that's whom God Almighty covenanted with, then the rest of this creation cannot fall in order also. Now, what is that talking about there? That's talking about the Israel message. People want to walk, what? what's a national Israel message? It's it right there. Meaning that God Almighty created Adam. We believe that Adam had a divine command, a dominion calling. And you go back in the scriptures and you will clearly see it says dominion. God gave Adam a dominion calling. And what was that dominion calling? Well, it was to be in the garden, this garden of Eden, and to dress it and to keep it and to, and to exercise godly authority and dominion over this creation. It means God Almighty gave Adam certain responsibilities, certain duties. God Almighty created him for this role. God Almighty ordained Adam and the Adamic people for this role of dominion. People don't want to talk about that. They don't want to think in those terms. They want to think within their own carnal box that, oh, God, that means because God called Adam that he called everybody to the same role and category and they all have the same calling. No. Does that mean that they don't have a dominion calling? No, I did not say that either. All of God's creation has a dominion calling. But there is a certain order in which they are to exercise that calling and that dominion. You get outside of it and you start applying it to the wrong people or this wrong group, you're going to come up with the wrong results. There's lots of authority and there's lots of dominion. We see an authority and we see a dominion coming from Malfunction Junction, Washington, D.C. every day. They keep changing the rules all the time to suit whatever is according to their carnal money manipulated concepts because it's really the money lenders which are controlling the shots for these guys. These guys aren't making up their own minds. I mean, yes, I'm aware of the lawyers and I'm aware of the bureaucratic and political process and I'm aware of their burdening us down with all these rules and regulations and nobody even knows what it means. That's why Congress doesn't even read them all the time. You hear about them making these laws and these policies and the reporters ask, have you read it? No, we haven't read it yet. But we're going to pass it. Hallelujah. Get ready. You're going to be blessed. What? Well, these guys get their orders from a group. And you know what this group is? Well, I don't know what it is exactly either. I got news for you. Well, what do you mean you don't know? Because they're the hidden hand. But you see... And it's called the money lenders. It's called the International Monetary Fund. It's called the Federal Reserve. It's called the Bilderbergers. It's called a lot of different things. It is the World Bank. And these guys just don't lend money to lend money. They're not blindly out there just saying, well, waiting for the UN or a federal government or a Congress to come. Hey, we need money for this or that. Oh, you do. Here, let me give you a, a, a couple of billion or trillion dollars. Do you think that's how it comes about? There isn't a law, there isn't a policy, there isn't 
whatever we got, and most of what we're operating on today is bureaucratic policies and dictates that are handed down because of the money lenders' demands. You want the money, honey? Then you've got to you've got to uh, endorse, and you've got to back these policies. Well, where did you get these policies? We have a plan. We have a globalist plan, and it's already ready for you. When you come for the money, we got the plan for you already, honey. And it's a bitter honey. But now there's a hidden hand, Christians, which is Jesus Christ. And it is the right hand of His authority by which we are upheld, which is outside the physical processes of what these things that I've been talking to you about. It is the very process that Moses used when they were fighting, the enemies were fighting the, uh, the uh, 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 Ammonites, I think, or Amorites. I could be wrong. Moabites, Hittites, Jebusites, Edomites, they're all about the same. And remember, he had his hand up in the battle. And at, when his hand went down, they started losing. When they raised his hand back up, isn't that amazing? When they raised his hand back up, they started winning. Well, what kind of power is that, may I ask you? Was that the money power? Was that a political idea or ideal? What was it? It was the hand of God. And listen, when we operate according to the right principles of God's word, we are operating by the hand of God. That's what we're doing. And I want us, I want the sons of God to operate by the hand of God. I want them living every day of their life thinking about Jesus Christ, thinking about the kingdom of God, and, and concerned every time they look at the news, every time they read the newspaper. They're looking at it through another mindset. A Holy Spirit guided, motivated mindset. That's what we need to do as sons of God. Now listen to me. As you do this, you can pray in a sense very much like Moses did over this nation because you're operating on a different level. You're operating on a level which is, I'm going to call it, spiritual. And most people will understand that. We are to operate on a higher spiritual level. Now listen. You can't do that unless the foundation is right. We've got to get the foundation order correct or we're not going anywhere. So what we need to do is be kind of masons. Oh, I knew it. You're talking about the uh, Masonic order. <laughs> you know, there are masons in the scriptures. And there are people that laid the foundation in the scriptures. And they were bricklayers of God's order in the scriptures. Where were watchmen on the wall in the scriptures? There are those that pressed in for the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus because they realized and they saw something much deeper, much greater, much more important than what the average individual saw out there. And the sons of God have been given this calling. We can't move in and attain our calling until we understand what that calling is. Because you may be supposedly, quote, in your calling, and if you don't know what the calling is, you're not going to be able to exercise your calling and function in your calling. So we've got to understand what we're supposed to do biblically. And as we understand our, biblical, our true biblical calling, then we can start making some fantastic changes. Now listen, our nation is in a big mess today. We're in a big mess economically, certainly we understand that. We're in a big mess politically. I mean, we have every antichrist ideology and philosophy that 
people are seeking today. And that's why we have so much confusion. How many of you feel, I mean, I know you're Christians, but you can feel that confusion and this state of confusion that our creation is in. And I want us to come out of this confusion. How do you know if you're a son of God or not? Because that's the calling of the sons of God. This creation, the Bible says, is in a bondage of corruption. And therefore, what has to happen? Does God have a plan of salvation for this creation? Way more than just going down the aisle and getting saved. And what do most people do? They go down the aisle, which is a good step. They get saved, and they just just stop right there. And they go around this merry-go-round. And our nation has not improved or changed, but continues to slide downhill. You see, when you go back and you read what our Christian forefathers understood and the biblical foundation they understood and that they sought to to develop and give us here in America, there's a big difference between their Christianity and their Christian view and perspective and what we have today in this modern Judeo-Christianity concept of truth. You see, there is a work. Can you not read that from what we just read here from Luke? There is a work that we are to do. Even Jesus said that, I am come to be about my Father's business, my Heavenly Father's business. Now, if you come along and you tell me, Dave, I'm here to serve my Heavenly Father, I'm here to serve Jesus Christ, and I'm here to do His business, I would assume you know what you're talking about, that you know that God, what His business, the business of the Father is, and that you're busy about doing that and applying His will, plan, and purposes. Wouldn't you assume that? And yet you ask Christians today, what is is that? What is your calling? Do you have a calling? Are you walking within that calling? Do you have a biblical understanding of God's will, plan, and purposes? Do you see things that are wrong in Washington, D.C.? Do you see things that are wrong in the policies and the dictates that are handed down to us by Malfunction Junction, Washington, D.C.? Are these people that are leading us, do they have a Christian perspective? Do they have a Christian understanding? Do they know God's law? Do they know what righteousness is? Do they know that righteousness exalts a nation? Sin brings our nation down. Do they know that? They don't have, exactly, they don't even have a fear of God within them. You know, I got to go and I got to read something for you here in Romans. A little bit off of our message, but I got to go and read it for you here. Listen to this, and, um, oh, it's in Romans 11. I missed it by a couple of chapters here. Uh, Romans 11, and let's start reading verse 15. For if, the, for if the casting away of them, now them is Israel in this verse. For the cast, because God divorced the northern house of Israel. For the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world. What is this word world, by the way? It's cosmos. Who is the creator of all things? Jesus Christ. Whom was all power given unto that the word of God tells us in Matthew 28? Jesus Christ. And therefore, does Jesus Christ have a plan of restoration for this creation? Well, I would think so. Okay. And so here we see the casting away of Israel, and we see in the casting away of Israel the reconciling of the world. It says, What shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. If the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, 
and thou be an wild olive, were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. You know, and it's going on, it's talking about this growth process. What tree do we need to be grafted into? If you're going to have, if our creation, if there's going to be salvation, quote, salvation for this creation, what tree do we need to be grafted into? The tree of life. Now the sons of God are of Israel. I can show you this throughout the scriptures. The, and when we're talking about the sons of God, also we are talking about a high calling. I like to know again what my calling is, and I want to especially know what my Heavenly Father has in, in store for me, in mind for me, and what His calling is for me. Otherwise, I can't walk in that. I'm just walking around in circles and flying around, bumping into the wall. And you know what Christians are doing today? They're sitting around in darkness by the rapture doctrine. And they don't want to do anything, and we don't feel the need to do anything because this world is not our home, they tell me, that I'm going to get raptured out of here. And so my hope is in the rapture. What if we had taken that position, Christians, all along? What if our forefathers took that position to the founding of this nation? You wouldn't have an American nation today. They did not have a rapture escapism mentality. They had a mentality that was based upon Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. Not this heavenly bliss where we go up into heaven, just get saved, bad guys go to hell, we swing around in heaven on, the, on the, uh, the pearly gates, drumming our heart, doing something. I don't know what. I don't know about you. And this is not blasphemy at all, but I just don't want to sit around in heaven saying, praise you, Jesus, praise you, Jesus, for billions and billions of years. Well, how can you say that, Dave? Because my blessing is going to be in doing what he has called me to do. My blessing is in the understanding of biblical restoration, which is throughout the word of God. You see, the, the heaven is really the kingdom of God. It's a kingdom function. It is a kingdom calling, and we are to be His kingdom people. All When you look throughout the, 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 the gospel, everywhere you turn within the gospel, Jesus is referring to a kingdom parable and a kingdom principle. How did we go from missing the kingdom truths to dwelling on heaven? Hey, I'm not against heaven, but I want the right heaven, don't you? And when, the, and when we read in the book of Revelations and other various places in the Bible where it talks about a new heaven and a new earth, what is that new heaven and new earth? I think I told you before, I remember having a conversation with, a, with an individual years ago, and I told him, this is what it's about. This is what the Word of God says. He says, you see? I said, see what? He says... <clears throat> There's going to be a new earth. You said there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, so your earth is done away with. Do you see that? And I said, well, then there goes your heaven, buddy, because you said there's going to be a new heaven too, right? Oh, yeah. And I said, what might a new heaven and a new earth mean? It means there's a new authority. There's a new king, the true dictator, the creator of all things, is coming to rule on this earth and he's going to establish his kingdom. I mean, there's a whole new paradigm shift when you start getting into that that just way out of the concept of most people. But if you, you see, our forefathers understood this. It was common knowledge. Our Christian forefathers knew this. Where do you think they got the principles for the Declaration of Independence. Where do you think they got the principles of freedom and, and liberty? Freedom and liberty doesn't come from a French Revolution concept of socialism. 
or communism. It doesn't come from democracy. You, because your freedoms, you may love and you may cherish your freedom. I don't care what it is. Think of a freedom you love and you cherish. Too bad there's a group over here and we're using democracy. And this group over here wants your money and your property. And they voted to take your money and your property and raise your taxes. Too bad. So how's your democracy concept of freedom doing right now? Like I say, they love to use democracy when it's, uh, when, when they can get away with it. But most of the time, I mean, it's just like this health plan. I didn't get a vote in it. And it's funny that other times when they know they've got it in the bag, why, we'll let the public vote for it. See, the public voted for it. In this situation, I didn't get a vote. And my taxes are being raised, and my property is, taxes are going up, and everything else. I mean, they tell us that taxes without reputation, representation is unconstitutional. If people understood that all we need is a small amount of taxes to have godly order and a godly government, it would blow them away. 10%. Do you realize, basically with 10%, I know there's other details involved in that, but let's, basic 10% concept. Do you realize that Israel of old conducted and had a military they had a civil servant governmental uh, branch that they used that was paid for with this 10%. And the church also was paid for with this 10%, temple services and all this other stuff. Hospitalization. I mean, all that a nation would need was covered in a 10%. It wasn't going to foreign aid to Israel and Germany and Japan and Mexico and wherever else you can then, uh, India. It didn't go to all this one world globalist concept. It didn't go to pay the bankers trillions of dollars in usury and debt. They had just weights and measures. They had godly money, which consisted of gold and silver and other things in exchange of services. If we had a true Christian model of economics today, we would be blessed beyond what you could imagine. How did King Solomon's temple and the kingdom under, under King Solomon become so great and wonderful? Right? All these various nobles and kings came to the kingdom and they said, wow. We're flat out amazed. We've never seen anything like this. Never. By the way, I'm going to be writing some articles on uh, Israel, ancient Israelites. When you go back and you look in, um, you all are getting kind of loud in the background there. I can hear you. When, when we stop and we think about ancient civilizations, you know what you think about? You think about people that uh, have these rags on, these loose rags on. They live in grass huts, and they're just dumb, poor, uncivilized people, uneducated. I want to tell you something, folks. I've got some stuff that's coming out that's going to blow people's minds. I know a lot of you know this, but a lot of people out there do not understand this, even people that understand there's a message. From the time of Adam on up, the Adamic people have always been a higher civilization and had, and had a higher order. They didn't live like these um, people do that you see con our concepts of, of an uncivilized uh, group. These are people that had tremendous kingdoms, tremendous wealth, tremendous blessings, Everywhere they went, I mean, there were cities, big cities, 
uh, buildings and, and uh, uh, structures that were built that way in advance of anybody else. I mean, stop and think about it, just this alone. We're all in awe about the, uh, the pyramid, the ancient pyramids, and look at the ancient structures way, way back when. I want to tell you something. It was common among the Adamites wherever they went to have these structures. I mean, stop and think, stop and think. This is way, way back, thousands and thousands of years ago, that these <coughs> tremendous structures were built. And as I'm going through, especially, uh, I, you know, I got to credit uh, Stephen Collins for a lot of his work on this, but I have some some books that I found that uh, were in our library, and it goes back to the ancient times, and it talks about historical fact after historical fact about uh, the, the miraculous, marvelous uh, civilization of, of the Adamites. And I'm talking about through the Israelites, too, on up into the time of the ancient Israelites. They were always an advanced order of people. You look at King Solomon, and you look at that temple, and you look at that kingdom, I want to tell you, there was none like it in the world. None. You know, who was involved in the, uh, in the building of the Tower of Babel? A lot of these ancient Adamites were involved in that even. I mean, they weren't building grass huts. You understand what I'm telling you? And so when we go back and we look at this, uh, we look at God's order of this creation, and we look at God's calling, God's choosing of Adam and giving him a dominion calling, when you really understand it and you really get a full vision of this, it'll blow your mind. Now, how did we become such a dumbed-down people today? Well, how do you imagine we became dumbed-down? When you get away from what the Word of God tells us, and you get away from his covenant, covenant calling and his covenant purposes for us, do you think that the, your enemy is going to become the head and you're going to become the tail? Do you realize that when we really get back to following God's prescribed way, God knowledge increases? I mean, you're just walking along all of a sudden day and some concept will come out to you and you say, my God, uh, Hydrotherapy, uh, the, this hydrogen, uh, creation of hydrogen and, and free energy. It's amazing. It's just there. I see it. Let me give it to you. I'll write it out for you. I'll draw a design for you. How many of you think I'm kidding when I'm saying things like this? I'm telling you, it has happened. Isaac Newton, all these other concepts of people of our race have been given God knowledge. I mean, I don't care if you go to Alexander Graham Bell, you go to Thomas Edison, you go to all these different... When we have true freedom in our nation, technology and, and uh, engineering uh, concepts that will just blow your mind start popping up all over the place. But what have we got? Well, we have, we have an enemy that knows exactly how to keep us dumbed down. I didn't really intend to get into this this morning, but I'm going to get into it a little bit. I just feel led to talk about it right now. Do you know that, our, that, uh, we, you know that we are all under mind control? And that what I want you to understand is there's a lot of mechanisms and a lot of devices that they use to keep us ignorant and to keep us um, well to keep us in line but to keep us looking at the very means of our destruction as our salvation I mean we could say by just watching the boob tube over and over you're looking at the means of your destruction and looking at his view of your salvation how many people just lap up what the news tells them all the time and what the media, and they're just looking for, you know, more. Give me more. Give me more. Every, I need more. They'll give you so much. Oh, give me more. Give me more. What do you mean, give you more? 
What are you? Well, I, I, I know if I keep watching long enough, I'll get the solution from NBC News and ABC and from who else out there, whatever. No, you're not. But let me tell you something. <clears throat> one, of the, one of the insidious means in which they use to keep us under mind control is shock therapy. Now, if I could take something amazingly shocking to you and show it to you, you would just kind of sit there and you wouldn't know what to say. Your mind would almost shut off. It would go on, it, it, would, it would just go blank almost because it would be so much you couldn't, you couldn't really comprehend it. Your mind would just shut off. Do you follow what I'm saying so far? I haven't told you what it is. Just imagine whatever though. And it is in this state of mind and a form of it that they are able to gain control over your mind and your heart and your thinking. But you know what they've learned? Is that they can take small amounts of this over and over and over and accomplish the same thing. And so even within the children's video games and the shock and the blood and the killing that goes on all the time, they use this even as a subtle form of mind control for our young people. They use the news and the way that it's geared and presented and all a lot of other programs that just blow you away that you think are just subtle. Why? This? How about Oprah Winfrey? How about 2020? How about The View? And Whoopi Goldberg, uh, 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 amazing knowledge. This stuff is not by accident, and it is a package of our mind control. Well, how do you stop it, and how do you come out of this mind control, Pastor? Well, quit listening to it. Now, I will tell you this, that those who are truly born again, truly born again. A lot of people think they're born again, but they are really not there. But those that are truly born again have power over this. That's good news. Now, the Bible says, can two walk together except they be agreed? How many of you agree with that? Uh, I want to take you now to a Bible verse. We don't have a whole lot of time. It's in Hosea chapter 4. I think you're going to like this. While you're doing that, I saw a bumper sticker the other day, and it said this, so I just had to write it down. It says, quote, If ignorance is bliss, why aren't more people happy? <laughs> let, me let, me, let me read that to you again. If ignorance is bliss, why aren't more people happy? And we've all heard of the uh, prophet Hosea. And that